Good evening. Happy Thursday once again. Welcome to the man cave. It's that time of week once again. Uh, let's see here. We got Jeff tonight. Hey, Jeff, how's life in Florida? Life in Florida is good. Cooled off a little today. Nice. It's pretty here today. It was 60, mid 60s here today and sunny. So it was definitely a, uh, a pretty day to be out. Oh, I haven't haven't done a whole lot this week, but I am looking forward to having a bourbon. And uh, I went to the liquor store earlier this week and bought a new bottle. I, I picked up this bottle called Rebel. This is a cask strength, wheated bourbon. It's uh, 120 proof. And I've had one pour out of it already, and it's it's pretty good. So that's that's what I'm going to have tonight. You having a drink with us tonight? Oh, absolutely. And we don't have we don't have Tanya with us tonight, so I'm going to try to keep up. Uh, looking on, keep up with the comments a little bit. I'll I'll see what we can do here, but I want to get a get a pour of this bourbon started. What are you having tonight? I'm having uh, Eagle Rare. Eagle Rare. So, uh, welcome aboard, everybody. See, we've got Hank and Manny, Mike, Brent, Brian. George is in here, V-Gas, and Russ. Excellent. I'm, I'm not understanding Manny's question. No more Kamado Joe. I don't know. Let's see, Manny. I'm not sure of what what that's referring to either. It's probably because I haven't been doing a lot of cooking on the Kamado Joe lately or not on video. I've been making videos on this uh, Lone Star Grill. And no, nah, Manny, I still cook on the Kamado Joes and I still will be cooking on the Kamado Joes. Uh, but right now I'm making video content on the Lone Star Pellet Grill and I'm going to be doing that I'll probably be making nine or 10 more videos on that thing before I go back to making any on the Kamado Joe. So I, I, I love, I love cooking on all of them. I've, I've, I, I still cook on the Kamado Joe's. I just haven't made video content on it recently, but I will be once I get my commitment, I've made a commitment to make a certain number of videos on that Lone Star grill. And I'm going to make more than the commitment, obviously, but I'm going to uh, go back to mixing the grills up, mixing videos up on the different grills once I get that commitment met. So I need to make I need to make some more video content there. But yeah, well, we'll, we'll take a second here, John. Cheers, buddy. Yeah. Cheers. I don't know much about this rebel. I tried to look it up. And this was a spur of the moment purchase when I went in. I hadn't seen it before, or if I had, I hadn't paid attention to it. And they had a, they had two versions of it. They had, I think one of them was a bottled in bond version, and another one was a cask strength. And I'm, I'm just naturally a fan of the cask strength for most things. Uh, I've gotten to where I can tolerate that higher level of alcohol but the flavor complexity in the cast strength bourbon just uh suits me better eric i drink my neat all the time i don't ever put anything in mine uh i've played around with that when i was learning there i've got one bottle back here somewhere it's it's kind of hard to see but it's this this bottle right here this is a jack daniels uh i think that's the Jack Daniels barrel proof that bottle when I was learning to drink that that one's a high proof as well it's probably the highest proof stuff I have I was having to put a few drops of water in that one to open it up until I could get used to that that much alcohol but normally yeah I'm just neat room temperature in the glass is the way I like to I like to have mine I've, I've never really done it any other way for the, I, well, I've tried it on ice, and I've, but I started out 
when I, and I've only been doing this for a couple of years now, I'm new to the bourbon scene and, uh, I decided just to start that way. And that's, that's the way I appreciate it the most when, when the bourbon cools down, in my opinion, it loses flavor. It's kind of, if you kind of think about like a pastry, you don't eat pastries frozen. You like to warm them up and it just makes, I don't know what it is. It makes the flavors more vibrant. And I think the bourbon's the same way at room temperature as compared to having it cold. Uh, what do you think about that, Jeff? Is that a, a fair assessment of how totally I, fair? <laughs> so totally fair. Uh, so I drink mine naked. <laughs> yeah, I have experimented with adding flavors to certain bourbons that I don't like. I've got I'm in my quest to learn to taste bourbon and figure out which bourbons I like and which bourbons I don't. I've ended up with some. 50 and 75 dollar bottles of bourbon that i don't care for and i don't throw them out they just get relegated to cooking and i have experimented with some of them as well like i'll uh take uh i'll add a flavor to it that i that i like like i'll add uh vanilla for instance if i'm i could put i could take a, a bottle of bourbon that i'm not a huge fan of the flavor of and i'll do something like put a half a teaspoon of vanilla extract in it to see what that does. And sometimes that makes it more appealing to me and sometimes it doesn't. But uh, since I like cooking with bourbon or, or doing flambe occasionally, I don't, none of it's going to go to waste. It's just, if I was buying bourbon to cook with, I would not be buying a $50 bottle under any circumstances. I would be using the inexpensive stuff like, you know, just a plain bottle of Jack Daniels Black Label or the benchmark, you know. Uh, there's no no benefit in cooking with expensive bourbon. So yeah, uh, that's the way I like mine, just neat. So Andrew says he likes a tiny splash of water, and that's fine. You know, you gotta you gotta drink it the way you like it, and if I you like it on ice, drink it on ice. If you like it neat, drink it neat. If you like it with with Coke, drink it with Coke. <laughs> so yeah, it's one. It's just like it's just like barbecue, guys. It don't. There's not a right way or a wrong way. There's not a cool way or an uncool way. You got to do it the way you like it. And uh, this just happens to be the way I like it. And it's really mainly because I probably haven't experimented enough with other ways i don't do mixed drinks i went through a phase where i tried I, I tried to learn to like a manhattan i tried to learn to like an old-fashioned uh they're okay but uh it's just not it's just not my interest i don't guess i don't i don't i used to drink mixed drinks when i was younger when i became of age to where i could first buy them i was all about getting a mixed drink every time i went to a restaurant that served it and uh now, when those things are ten dollars a piece, I'm asking myself, mm, I don't think I want to do that. <laughs> only mixed drink I've ever had is rum and coke, and the only reason yeah. why I had it that way is so that you could hide the rum while I was working. <laughs> yeah, back when I was so, a chef, <laughs> I'd take care of my maitre d, and he'd take care of me with rum and coke. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I want to run through what I'm going to call a failure this week. We'll run through it quickly because I didn't, I didn't do a video this week, so I don't have a, I don't have a legitimate cook to show you guys. This John, week. John, wait just a second before you call yours a failure. If you're yeah. calling yours a failure, what the heck are you calling mine? Today? Well, after I did, after I <laughs> An did abomination. Mine, yeah. After I did mine, Jeff decided to give it a try and uh, Jeff totally screwed the pooch on his and we'll talk about that too but let me let me show you here this is i was i, I was going to make this bread pan de cristal that's uh it, this is span is a spanish origin bread and it that translates to the glass bread and the the uh, intention here is to have a huge bubbly open crumb like you see in this picture and it's it's a it's a generic 
basic recipe pretty much but it's extremely high hydration it's a it's a very wet dough it uses equal parts of flour and water by weight it's a hundred percent hydration so this is not something i'd call a beginner loaf by any means and i think jeff will probably agree with me on that this this handling this dough is not a good place to start but i wanted to make this and the reason i decided this week i wanted to give it a try is because i saw the video for this recipe from king arthur on youtube this week and the guy made it look easy and i i knew that i had enough hands-on experience with making bread by hand that i thought i could pull it off and i got close so uh where we're gonna go where i started out from there is the basic ingredients here flour water salt and yeast this, that's all that goes into this but this one this recipe needs a strong flour and king arthur bread flour is a is a stronger flour than your typical bread flours so that's what i use i i keep this one on hand here all the time so that's that's why i've got that label on the outside of my canister because that's always what's in it i do buy the organic version of this when they have it at the grocery store i shop at but they they don't always have the organic but this recipe was 500 grams of flour 500 grams of water 10 grams of salt two and a half grams of yeast so uh the first thing i did was i dumped my one thing i didn't do here that i normally do and you can tell from my picture that i didn't do it is i normally sift my flour i normally dump my flour into a sifter and run it through but i didn't in this case i just dumped my flour in there i dumped the salt and the yeast in on top of it and then i took my little uh french whisk or whatever you want to call that thing and mixed it around then i dumped all my water in and started working that dough and it is a shaggy wet mess at this point this is uh this is what you have and at this point in the process you just want to get all the lumps out of the flour you don't want any lump flour left at this point and you need to you need to mix it until you have that and then i greased up uh an eight by eight dish here with a little olive oil and i dumped i dumped all that flour and dough or i dumped my dough into this and i covered it up and you just let this sit for 20 minutes because you want to make sure that the flour has absorbed all of the water that it can absorb before you get started and that 20 minutes is really a short what they call an auto lice which uh it helps fully hydrate the flour and it helps get the gluten formation started so i covered that up and let it sit for 20 minutes and you can see that it quickly spreads itself out to the edge of the container because there's no cohesive nature to this dough yet because we haven't started building a gluten network. And um, this has to go through several stretch and folds by hand. I don't have videos or pictures of me folding it, but the first, the first phase of this, you just reach into the corner of the pan and you grab a corner, pull it up, you come over a little bit, you pull it up and stuff it back down on top and you work your way around the pan and do that eight or 10 times and just fold it over. And then you cover it back up and let it sit for another 20 minutes. And then uh, after it's been sitting for 20 minutes, you do, what do they call it, Jeff, a coil fold? Yeah, the, the recipe calls it a coil fold. So for the first coil fold, you reach in in the middle of the pan underneath the dough and you lift it up. You lift this wet, soggy dough mass up. And then when it comes out of the pan, you lay it back down in the pan and let it fold over itself. Then you rotate the pan 90 degrees and do the same thing again. And in the video I watched, he was doing that more than one time, which I think is part of the problem I had, why mine didn't come out the way I wanted. But this is what it looked like just after i had done that stretch and fold that the the bowl the coil fold jeff this is what my first coil fold looked like when i set it back down in the pan so i covered it back up let it sit for 20 minutes you come back to it and you do that coil fold again 
So that's the second coil fold. Then you let it sit for 20 minutes. You come back and do it again, which will be the third coil fold. And is there a fourth coil fold? Yes. So yeah, okay, here we are. This is what mine looked like after the fourth coil fold. And what's, what's not showing here is I didn't take a picture of what this dough looked like right before the fold. This dough had oozed itself back out mostly to the corners of the pan each time I've done this. But each time you do this fold of that dough, you can tell that the dough is building some strength because it, it becomes harder harder to fold the way you want it to and it wants to stay in a in a, a raised ball a little bit longer but after the final coil fold you go through four of those you cover that thing back up and i think it said we're going to sit for 80 minutes yep we're going to let it sit for an hour and 20 minutes for this recipe and when i come back after an hour and 20 minutes this is what i have you know it's spread all the way back out to the edge of the pan and you can look at this and you can kind of see i didn't do any close-up there's some little bubbles that are forming on the top of this that you can see they're not very large there's there's one out by the edge here maybe on the right side of that picture that's a little larger so you know your yeast is working but at this point they want us to take it out of the pan and this this is a uh, an area where experience is handy because you want to get it out of the pan as best you can without degassing this dough. We don't want to punch this dough down. So I took, I did like the guy did in the video. I took one of my plastic dough scrapers and kind of went around the edge of the pan to detach it from the edge. And then I just flipped the pan over onto a heavily floured work area. And uh, then I, I coated that surface, the top surface with a nice heavy coat of flour because in the video, they separate this thing into four pieces, which is what I've done. And of course, mine didn't come out as pretty. I should have worked on shaping this a little bit better, but I was trying not to degas it too much. So this stage, you break this into four pieces and put each piece on some parchment paper, and then you just let it sit out uncovered for two hours. Two hours, right, Jeff? Yep. Okay, two hours for this. And after, after it's set for about an hour, it's time to fire the oven up. And I put my baking stone in the oven because we want to preheat that oven to 475. And you need to preheat it adequately and preheat that stone adequately. So I gave it an hour at 475. And then I just took one of my pizza peels and slid it up under my parchment paper and then we loaded that guy onto my baking stone in my regular oven. And when I get this process worked out, guys, I will move it to the Joe. I'll cook this on the Kamado Joe. But while I'm learning the new process, I'm doing it in the oven just to take it, any additional variables out. So the recipe called for about a 28-minute cook. And uh, this is right after it went in. And this is about 13 minutes into the cook. There's some amazing oven spring going on here. That's about 13 or 14 minutes in. And this was at 28 minutes. 28 minutes look good. It's a little darker than I would have liked it. So I did my next two pieces at uh, the two pieces on the right here were 25 minutes instead of 28. So they're not quite as dark on the outside. But don't think for a minute that that dark is not good because it is. When I, when I cook sourdough, that's, that's the way I like mine on the outside. I like it dark on the outside like that. But then after this thing's cooled completely, you cut it open and you have this. This, uh, this, this is what I would consider a, a, a nice airy crust open crust but or open crumb but it's not what i was looking for it's not as open as this that's what i wanted and this is what i got and i know some things i can do to improve that so i'm going to try it again one of the things that helps with that open crumb is to not overwork the dough i think i performed too many stretch and folds uh, when i was doing my 
coil folds, Jeff, mm -hmm. I probably did four or maybe five coil folds each time. In the video, he was only doing two. He was doing one, yeah. rotating at 90 degrees and, and doing it a second time. And yeah, that, that's all he did. That's what I'm going to do when I do this next is I'm going to, on my coil folds, I'm just going to do two coil folds on each one. And I think that alone should dramatically improve this. So that is where I landed the, in my cooking project this week. Now, one other thing, this, this is really good, by the way, it tastes incredible and it made some fantastic toast. This, this is a good toasting bread. I don't think it's going to be good for a whole lot other than toasting. I don't, I don't know if it'd be a good, I don't think it'd be a great sandwich bread, but it might. Well, if mine comes out tomorrow, I'll let you know because pastrami yeah. will be going on it. So, hey, John, if you got that video of my uh, disaster, you can go ahead and show that and show everybody what it's not supposed to do. <laughs> uh, well, I do. Hang on a second. Let me uh, let me uh, find that because that's in our our chat on Facebook. Let me. Uh, Jeff sent me a video of what was going on with his. This is not what it's supposed to look like, guys. Oh, uh, hang on. So, give me just a second. I got to scroll back and find that. Shouldn't be that far back in the in our chat. It's in our chat, not the other chat. Right. So while John's finding that. Yeah, Mike, I'm a little off of keto right now. Uh, heart doctor wants me to kind of back off a little bit on keto, so I'm doing that. Uh, well, John's finding that. The, uh, okay, go ahead and bring it up. We'll all get a good laugh. Well, this is, uh, the, well, daggum. Okay. Here we go. This is what the coil fold's supposed to look like. When Jeff was, <laughs> when Jeff was picking his up, it was not, it didn't have any cohesiveness, no. but it should have lifted that entire mass of dough out, but his was breaking. And what that's telling me is that there's no glute, there's not a strong enough gluten network there to hold that dough together. And we haven't figured out why Jeff's came out like this yet, because everything, you know, Jeff says he measured everything precisely and uh, something is bad wrong with that. So I don't know. We're trying round two tomorrow. But anyway, if yours looks yeah. like that, stop. Don't even bother messing with it. Throw it in the garbage and start all over again. So, yeah, it's it's <laughs> one of these things. Bread, this is one of the things I love about bread. It's challenging. It's far yeah. more challenging than barbecue. Basic bread's not so challenging, but something like this one, this one takes a little bit of uh, practice. And I may, Jeff, it, we didn't we, we didn't try something like this in our, uh, our bread series during the during the pandemic, but we did, we did ciabatta and we did the focaccia, both which are higher. Yeah. Uh, they're higher. You could do, you could make focaccia with this. This was right. It was, it, well, that's it, what it, I was like. Yours did, your recipe didn't come out right, but if <laughs> I had taken, I could have taken mine and spread it out in a pan and made focaccia out of it. And it probably would have been pretty good yeah. at the higher. Okay. Anyway, analog, yeah. you know, there was there's 10 grams of salt in it. Uh, the dish size was not the problem. It's the exact same dish size that the guy was using in the video. So mm -hmm. it's I sent John yeah. pictures of everything that I did. You know, I, I measured and I took pictures of each thing yeah. on the scale with the correct measurement, and it just honor says we're, we're thinking about got bad flour. Overrated. Open crumbs overrated, but it's like a smoke ring, man. It's something I want. I want to be able no. to get it. <laughs> I want to. I want it because the thing I like about the open crumb like that is what it looks like when you toast it. When each when those those big holes have that that uh, Maillard reaction brown ring around it, it's just beautiful. It, it's it's a presentation thing. It's to me, it makes a presentation that's hard to beat. And plus the, the the added plus, it's a great place to hold your butter. Yeah. <laughs> so, in my Don't opinion, be that, wrong. 
that shouldn't be butter. I should use, I would be, I would want to use it. And if I was toasting that and doing what I really want to do with it, I would be drizzling an infused olive oil on top of that one instead of butter probably, or I would be dipping it in uh, olive oil, which is it, is it Carabas? Which one of these Italian restaurants is it that gives you when they bring your bread, Carabba. they give you, they give you this little olive oil thing and it's got a little bit of uh balsamic vinegar drizzled in olive oil and, yeah and some some herbs and spices that's really good and this kind of bread would be good with that too yep. i know it but it's olive oil balsamic vinegar uh it's a really beautiful flavor that's that little sweetness that comes from that balsamic vinegar in there is incredible but that's that's kind of a sourdough thing i don't know how well this would do one of the things i also noticed personally about this recipe is my my mind wants it to have a little bit more salt in it so i'm gonna i'm gonna up the salt content that has two percent salt and a baker's percentage it's got 10 grams of salt for 500 grams of flour that's two percent i'm gonna up it to two and a half on my next round and uh jeff that also salt also tightens up the dough mm -hmm. salt helps uh salt strengthens the dough so that that might be helpful in the long run too, is having a a little bit more salt. I don't know how much salt that guy put in it from King Arthur either, because he volume measured his. He didn't weigh his salt, or no, he did weigh the salt. He, he did weigh some. He, he weighed did. he okay. weighed everything but the uh, everything but the yeast. But the yeast, yeah. because the yeast is such a small amount on the big scale, it's yeah hit or miss whether you get it. I'm curious about how well this would do in a cold ferment as well. I think uh, that might be, you know, I told you, I'm, I was thinking about trying this as a bull uh, using a banneton to do mm -hmm. it. I might, uh, when we get to that state, I think if I was going to do that, what I would do is after that 80 minute stage, mm -hmm. I would form a dough ball with, I would dump what I had out. I would shape it into a dough ball, put it in the banneton, and instead of letting it sit out on the counter for two hours, I would go to the fridge with it and let it stay in the fridge overnight. And then what I do with my sourdough loaves when I do that, I bring those out and I don't let those come back to room temperature. I go straight to the hot stone with those right out of the fridge. And you want to talk about oven spring that that might uh, the cold ferment. I would probably use a little yet less yeast. If that used two and a half grams of yeast for what we did there, and I was going to do what I just said as a cold ferment, I would probably take it to one and a half grams of yeast mm -hmm. because that yeast is going to continue. It, you need to slow down the yeast process a little bit if you're going to let it go for 24 hours in the fridge. But that uh, that bread is something I want to get. I want to get that down pat because if I can, if I can uh, comfortably say that I can make bread with 100% hydration flour, I think I've really uh, started to arrive <laughs> in the world of, of home-baked breads because, I don't know, the the guy that I saw do focaccia with 100% hydration mixed his uh, focaccia dough in one of those spiral mixers. Mm -hmm. So... You're, what what we do ours at? 80, 80 or 85%? I think we were at 80. Uh, but you don't have to have the, you don't have to have it holding a cohesive shape to be focaccia because it's a flatbread. You know, yep. it's going to take the shape of whatever pan you put it in. But, uh, and you don't want that kind of open crumb on focaccia. It needs no. to have, the focaccia needs to be tighter than that. But, uh, I'm curious now about making 100% focaccia, so that's probably going to happen. So <laughs> we'll see. Uh, Russ is asking about the dish size. Was that a problem? I don't think that was a problem. No. Same size uh, dish as the guy was using. Well, Jeff had the same size dish. The guy in the video was using a 7 by 10, but I had an 8 by 8. I don't have a 7 by 10, but. I'm but he also use, he also said that you could do the eight by eight and it's it just fine. He said whatever dish well, you want to do. Yeah. I do have an eight by ten Detroit pan I could have used, and I, I might try that next time. 
because I haven't made pizza in that pan yet. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, that's that's where I landed with my cook this week. I didn't uh, I didn't do a legitimate grill cook, and I didn't make a video this week. I've had I've had ta my wife's been off work this week. Tanya's off work during the spring break, so I decided not to uh, tie up all my time with cooking this week and i've enjoyed we've spent time together this week and done a little shopping tanya tanya's not with us tonight because she's sitting upstairs watching ncaa basketball on her new tv <laughs> tanya is uh very happily watching a really nice tv upstairs she's happy once again the tv we had tanya likes high-end tvs she doesn't she's she's not interested in and in cheap tvs and the TV that we were watching was a Sony Bravia that she bought. We looked it up. She bought it 15 years ago, and back then she paid $1,300 for it. It was a really nice TV, but she got 15 years out of it, and uh, the picture was going bad. The contrast and the color were just shot, and uh, we did, uh, Tanya did our taxes this week, and when we figured out that we weren't going to have to, uh, write a big check to the government <laughs> we decided it was time to go ahead and get the tv so she had picked out a an lg uh evo oled evo really nice tv and uh it's got an amazing picture so that's where tanya is man. that's why tanya's not with us the tar heels play at 9 30 so that's where i'm gonna be at 9 30. we're not gonna run long tonight <laughs> so anyway what i wanted to talk about next is jeff i think next week I'm gonna do brisket. We've I've talked about it, but I'm gonna go. I'm probably gonna try to go Monday and uh, pick up a brisket at Sam's Club, and I'm gonna do a brisket video this coming week. And I'm trying to decide whether I'm gonna do two brisket videos on the Lone Star, just like I did with pork butts. I'm gonna do a low and slow, and I'm gonna do a hot and fast. But I think I'm gonna do that hot and fast method first. And, uh, I may I may do uh, my last brisket too this week. Then. I'm gonna do uh, that Myron Mixon inspired technique where he cooks at 350, and I think he cooks it unwrapped for four hours. Something like that. Three or four hours unwrapped, and uh, then he puts it in the pan, foils it. Uh, does he add any liquid to the pan, or does he just put the brisket in? The leftover Aju that you have from uh, your injection. Oh, I'm not going to inject it, so okay. I won't have that. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I don't bother injecting briskets, so I will. Uh, Put yourself some tallow on top of it. I could do that because I'll have I'll have my trimmings that I'll put in there. Yeah, that would work. I will trim. There's this new fad. That I keep seeing on the internet on in our social media groups about not trimming briskets and uh, have you have you seen these briskets that these guys are cooking where they're not trimming them? I'm not sure if I if I like that because especially since everybody's all gangbusters about how they want that amazing smoke ring, but now they don't want to trim the brisket. So I don't know what would happen to a smoke ring if you didn't if you didn't trim. The brisket. I don't know. I don't gonna, think you're going to get a smoke ring if you. Don't I'm going to. I'm going to continue to trim my briskets the way I trim mine. I don't do what would be considered a competition style trim. I'm not that aggressive on it. I'm not where I'm not buying into this aerodynamic thing that if you don't have a aerodynamically smooth brisket that something's going to be wrong with it. Because, pardon my French, but that's bullshit. <laughs> that's that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the only, it's the only yeah. trimming that I do to my brisket. I take the fat off, and then on that thin end, if it's yeah. really tapered down to like barely nothing right. down there, yeah. I'll, I'll cut that back enough until I can get. Uh, I do too. I want about three I want, quarter of an inch. I want mine thicker than that. I'll cut it off. Anything that's less than an inch thick or an inch and a quarter thick out there at the end, I'm cutting it off because it will be inedible when the brisket's done. So one of the other things I like to do is I, I look and see which way my grain's running on that on that flat. And on one of the corners of that flat, 
I'll cut off a, a piece that's a 90 degree cut off of the grain where there's no question about which way your grain's running when you're good, when you're ready to go back and cut slices. That way you can cut exactly perpendicular to the grain when you're going mm -hmm. up the uh, when you're going up the flat. But uh, I haven't cooked a brisket on the Lone Star Grill yet, and probably what's going to happen this this brisket. The hot and fast brisket and the low and slow brisket will be the last two briskets that I cook. I, I don't intend to cook brisket anymore after that unless I have to for some reason. I'm just, I'm, I'm in the, I don't like brisket camp so much anymore. Well, I, after I did that chuck roast that last time, yeah, you know, I just assumed do the chuck roast. Even I though might, it's more expensive per pound, but I might continue to use brisket if I want to make pastrami because I think brisket is a good cut to make pastrami with. And uh, what, I, what I will likely do in the event that I want to make pastrami again is I'll buy a brisket. I'll cut the piece that I want to make pastrami, and I'll grind the rest of it for hamburger. Because well, did I'm, you look at that package, that uh, picture that I sent you? On, I uh, didn't look at it in detail. I saw that it was a Snake River Farms package. Right, but it's a, uh, it's a beef round. It's, it's not... Uh, it's not a flat, and it's about two and a half inches thick. Is it a beef round? What is that yeah. a? What what is the beef? What does that mean? It just says premium corned beef round. It is not a flat. It's not an eye of round, is it? No. Mm -mm. No. Almost looks uh. Almost looks like picanha. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. So I'm interested to see how that comes out. I mean, it was Snake River Farm. It was a good price. It was right. uh, eight ninety nine a pound. Yeah. But I need I need for you guys to keep in keep me in mind if you see Kroger having that dollar ninety nine brisket sale again, because I'm gonna drive. I don't know that it'll matter. I may have got. I may not need brisket, but I want. I do want to buy some brisket to experiment making hamburger with it. And I'd be mm -hmm. willing to do that because I want to see if I can get hamburger meat that I like out of a brisket just by grinding just a hundred percent brisket. And I, I've read everything I need to read and I understand what I need to do. I just need to get a brisket and I would be extremely happy if I could get a dollar 99 a pound brisket to do that with, because I'm going to grind the whole thing. Well, Kroger's is leaving Florida. Are they? Yeah. Well, they they've, they've practically already left North Carolina too. Well, the only thing that we had was that fulfillment center for the uh, uh, delivery, home delivery. Right. But it just made the news today. They're closing that uh, that one, the one in Texas, and someplace else. They said it didn't meet their uh, uh, volume expectations. So I guess we're not going to yep. see a, a Kroger come to Florida anytime soon. Brian, my Sam's Club has choice. Angus beef briskets for three ninety nine a pound, and their prime briskets are four ninety nine a pound. And I buy the uh, choice Angus because I can't tell the difference in the two. I've bought prime briskets and I've bought the choice Angus beef briskets at Sam's Club, and I I can't tell the difference. And I'm not going to pay the extra dollar a pound for prime when I can't tell the difference. The one thing that I will say that I can tell the difference on the quality of the brisket at Sam's is better than Costco. Uh, that I couldn't tell you because I've never bought a Costco brisket. I'm contemplating renewing my Costco membership, but I haven't made up my mind if I'm going to do that yet. Cause once again, I do have to drive an hour or a little over an hour to get well, to Costco. Well, you don't need to buy yourself a Costco brisket. You can just take my word for it. Well, I'll Co Costco's the, got other things that I like yeah. that I can't get at Sam's club. So I'm trying to decide if it's worth it for me to be a Costco member. I think it might be worth it for me to renew the $60 a year yeah. membership. But Tanya and I, when we were in there several years back, they conned me into upgrading to the gold membership in store. And uh, we did that. And I can't renew at a lower level through the app or through the website. I've got to go back to the store if I want to become a member at the lower level again, but I may just go back down there and do that. Cause I've talked to Tanya about it and to break even on Costco's uh, 
gold membership, that membership's one hundred and twenty dollars a year. And for 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 me to recoup one hundred and twenty dollars through their two percent uh, cash back or whatever they call it from that membership, I got to spend six thousand dollars there over the course of the year to recoup that hundred and twenty dollars. And uh, I just I don't envision, I envision us spending six thousand dollars a year at Costco. Not when it's that far away from you. Like I said, you know, yeah. I've got four Costco's. Uh, yeah. The farthest one's out 13 miles. And if I, I, had I buy nothing but Costco gas. So, I mean, that's, that's a big expense right there. Yeah. Do you get reward back on your Costco gas purchases? Yeah, well, on my uh, executive membership, which is the gold, I get yep. back usually uh, between 175 and 200 a year. Then yeah. I also have the Costco credit card, which, like I said, I pay it off at the end of each month. I got back two hundred and forty-four dollars this year. So between yeah. the two of them, I got back over four hundred dollars. That's not bad. No, but I mean, that's not worth it to me. It's just not convenient for me since I don't have a Costco local to me. Mm -hmm. The closest no, where you're uh, at, I wouldn't do the executive membership. It's, yeah, you wouldn't. Uh, you wouldn't make. Well, I talked to Tanya about it because you can mail order stuff and have it delivered to the home. Mm -hmm. And I, I was having to, I'm not done evaluating that yet. I'm trying to figure out if some of the stuff that we're buying from Amazon that we're buying through a subscription service, if I can get the same stuff through Costco or get similar stuff through Costco and shift some of the money we're spending online elsewhere to Costco to see if I can make it uh, financially a better deal for me to shop at Costco, but yeah, but with your really, kickback that you're getting on uh, Amazon, right? Uh, See, I do the you, same thing. I've got the Amazon credit card, the Amazon yeah, so Prime right. card, and everything that everything that I buy on Amazon with that card. Tanya and I both have the card, mm -hmm. and uh, we get five percent back on everything yep. we buy from Amazon. With that same card, I get two percent back on every gas station purchase and every mm -hmm. restaurant purchase that I make F uh, food and gas are 2% back. And then everything else is 1% back. So I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm getting way more money. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a uh, hundred dollars a month back sometimes on that card. Mm -hmm. it's, it's worth it for me to, to do that. And maybe, maybe that's what I should be doing. Maybe I should not be, trying to refocus uh, away from Amazon because I'm, I'm getting a better deal there. And that's another thing I had to deal with this week. My credit card got compromised somehow. My Amazon card, I got a, I got an email. I thought that was a scam to start with until I started looking at it. But uh, there were some illegitimate purchases attempted on my credit card that the, cha the, the Amazon cards with Chase and Chase had stopped. They denied the purchases right away and then contacted me about it. So I had to wait. They had to shut down my card and send me a new card. And luckily, I guess I'm a good enough customer with Chase that they had another card in my hand the next day. This this was on what day is today? Thursday. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on the phone with them Tuesday morning trying to sort this out, what was going on. And they told me that they would have a new card to me within 48 hours, but it showed up yesterday. It showed up the next day via UPS. So I was pretty happy about that. I didn't have to go without the card. And since I, since I used that card for everything, I didn't want to be without it for too long. <laughs> and, uh, but I've already gone and adjusted everything. I think I've gotten everything that that's fixed, you know, got everything straightened out. But anyway, I don't want to, don't want to elaborate too much there. That's not what we're here for, but brisket. I want to cook brisket this coming week. And I think I'm going to do the hot and fast one first, maybe because that's about a seven or eight hour process. Start to finish. Sound about right. Uh, I think no, mixings is like five and a half. That's the cook. And then you rest it for how long? Uh, Minimum of two, yeah. preferably four, minimum. So, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. But the bread, 
I know I know I've bored my audience tonight talking about bread. Janice uh, made it in here. <laughs> no, they, they really shouldn't yeah. get bored because it as we discussed earlier today, it really is therapeutic. It is when but, you're when you're kneading the bread or the dough and whatnot. It's very yeah. calm. Turn on some nice music and just kick back and just go with it. The uh when I get this process down pat, I might make a video on how to, on on this on making this so you can see what that dough looks like. But it's it's wet, and Jeff really did have a wet, nasty mess there. At no point in my process, even when I mixed mine initially, mine didn't look as glo as gloopy as Jeff's did. Something something went wrong there. I can't I figure know. out what it is. I'm gonna pick up a new bag of flour. I mean, that's the I only would thing that, because that I, I would because it's, if if your flour was measured accurately. I wouldn't use that. I wouldn't trust that flour to make it again. I wouldn't. I'd go get a new bag. I guess the flour could be bad, but my my guess is, and I know you said you got it right, but my guess is is that you had well under 500 grams of flour. That's yeah. the only thing. I know your water was good because I could tell that by looking at the picture, but I can't guarantee. I don't know 100. I don't have 100% irrefutable evidence that you had 500 grams yeah. of flour. I can tell you, John, as yep. I was doing it, I'm taking pictures yep. and I hit the zero button and it's zero. And I sat there and started putting it in and I watched that thing climb all Do the way up from 200 to 300 to 400 grams. Do this then. When you make it tomorrow, you've still got flour in that flour bag, right? Yeah. That flour that you've got out there in the oven, just throw it in the garbage can. Do it again with the flour from the bag. And see if you get a different result. Because we, if you don't, we won't be comparing apples with apples. Yep. Do it with the flour in the bag. And doubly check. Make sure that you've got 500 grams. And uh, see what. See if you get a different Janice, result. Janice, your comment, Jeff. I don't. I did not know you made the bread too. I didn't make the bread. The bread was a disaster. You 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 missed the video. He attempted he attempted it, but he had a failure, an ingredient failure somewhere down the process, and it didn't come together. But that's that's not something that's not a, a, a item of shame here because this is a difficult recipe. It uh, is. I, I say, John, I, it's it's got to be the flour because I know darn good and well that the the scale was zeroed because like make i said it, when i started make dumping it, it again in tomorrow make it again make a half batch don't don't since if, if we think the flour is actually bad just make a half batch do a 250 gram batch okay. instead of instead of a 500 and see if it'll come together and if it does come together if it does come together apples to apples on the well no go ahead and do the 500 gram batch where we're comparing apples to apples again and if it does come together i'm going to say that you didn't have 500 grams of flour that could be the only that would be the only explanation at that point well that might be but like i say i i know I, for a fact i, I zeroed reason, it and i yeah, watched it the reason i'm it. asking those because i've made the mistake that i'm I, thinking might have happened here i've made the mistake we've all made that mistake but like yeah. i say I, with the I've pictures that i was it. taking I've set the bowl on the scale and forgot to zero it before I put my flour in. And if that's the case, whatever that bowl weighs, you're that much short on the flour that you had that you need. John, I, I can guarantee you that that's not the case. Hang on just a second. <laughs> Hang on just a second. Okay. But this. I, there's there's not a lot of possible explanations as to why that didn't come together. The only explanation I have is that John, the yeah. bowl that I used is fifteen hundred nine grams. Yeah. Empty. So you right? You saw the picture with five hundred grams. So there's yeah. no way that that scale was not zeroed. Unless you had your thumb on the scale when you zeroed it. Come on, John. <laughs> I got to come up with some. I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking. When, when, I, when I don't have an explanation, I try to look at the uh, possibilities. Oh, I and, agree. But 
you know, when, when he started saying that, I said, wait just a second. Yeah. I know that the bowl that I used was more than 500 grams. I didn't realize it was that much. I don't have any bowls that are that heavy. My well, that's the old that's bowls. the old Pyrex bowl from my grandmother. Yeah. Okay? And like my, I say, it's 1,509 grams. I've got a glass. I've got a couple of glass bowls around here somewhere that are those. You know, have you ever seen those? Uh, yes. You have? Yes. Uh, the Janus. Oh, okay. The, uh, the Pampered Chef batter bowls that have the no, handles and the, course, the glass ones. I've got a couple of those, and they're really heavy. I don't mm -hmm. use them, but... Uh, so we, I just, we, like I said, we can put the, we can put it to rest as far as the grams. Do it, do it again tomorrow, and use the flour that's in the bag. Don't use that flour that you've set out because if yeah. that works, if if it comes together with that flour that you've got sitting out, you won't, you still won't have any idea what the problem is. No, because like I say, uh, there's no way that it was the flour because the bowl itself is 1,509 grams. Right. And the picture that I showed you that I took, you know, of weighing everything, it was at 500 grams. So there's no way that you can get 500 grams on top of the 1,509. Right. So, so I don't know. Something one of those things that fecal matter hit rotary oscillator and it didn't work. Something is awry, but I think, <laughs> I don't know. That's just, that That looked like a gloopy mess. That no, after this, it's not the yeast. The, the yeast doesn't no. form gluten. Gluten is only formed with water and flour. We had, Jeff and I had that conversation already too, because Jeff, yeah. Jeff brought that up and the yeast wouldn't have mattered. No. The, ye the, the yeast could not have mattered. And there's no way that that could be self-rising flour and not bread flour because that's not a mistakable difference. No, that's it's the blue bag. And it's the blue bag of King Arthur bread yeah. flour. I say, I'm going to buy another bag of flour and just yeah, do it because I want to make sure I get a good result because, like I said, I want to use it for my pastrami that I'm making tomorrow. Right. And, and I did have a cook this week, but I didn't want to show it because it's the same one that I did couple weeks ago it says uh, uh, keto uh, sliders right and if, if anybody's oh. interested in that recipe for those uh, buns that I'm making it's in my uh, pops pits pies plenty more let me bring up another picture here I, I got a uh, I, I, I talked about it before I know I brought up the uh, thing about the new camera stand that I was getting so I could possibly do some live cooks. This guy showed up today and uh, it's going to work out really nicely. It's going to give me the tool I need to position my camera to do some live stream cooking. So uh, that's here and I've been playing with it today. So I have, I have what I need now to try to do that. And Jeff, we'll get together and talk about that sometime too. I want to, in the live stream cooking that I'm going to want to do to begin with, is going to be stuff on the griddle or maybe in the walk mm -hmm. and, and not, uh, you know, stuff that happens quickly watching, doing a live, if live stream cooking would be boring if things aren't going, aren't moving quickly. Yeah. So I want to, I want to play with the griddle some uh, with the live stream and I'm going to have to take the, the, the lid off of my griddle for this to work the way I want it to, but I should be able to set my laptop up and set up everything outside and do live stream cooking that way. And uh, make everything fun. You know, that one of the things I thought about starting with on a live stream cook, you remember the the chopped cheese? Yep. I think that'd make a fun live stream cook. Yeah, because that, that's a quick cook. Yep. And different different kinds of quesadillas or you know, the cheese steak, cheese steaks or smash burgers is one. I want to do a live stream on smash burgers because I've, I've modified the way I do smash burgers over the years and it's, it's evolved into what it is now. And I want to get that going. So there's several things I can do. And that, that won't be a Thursday night thing that won't replace this. That'll be something I do in addition to this. If I do it, I won't do a, uh, I'll do the live stream cooking uh, separately. 
Ooh, what else? Do you have a favorite bread knife? Yes, I do. Mine is my shoon. That shoon, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say the shoon bread knife is not great because it is, but I've got, I've got a less expensive bread knife that I really like. Oh yeah, <laughs> so do I. It, it doubles. I'm doubling it as a as a brisket slicer. It's a 12 inch Victorinox. Yep. And uh, I, Tanya, what I had I had my shoon bread knife for about two weeks before my wife confiscated it. It that knife lives in her knife block in the upstairs kitchen. My knife, my knife down here. I don't have that down here, but. Uh, that Victorinox 12-inch slicer that's serrated is is what I'm using for bread because I can it doubles as a brisket slicer. I can use it to slice brisket with as well. And uh, knives are something that uh, I've spent a lot of money on over time. Oh, speaking of that, Jeff, how how are you liking the the Kramer? The, well, that's the, what I was just getting ready to say. Had that Kramer have been out before I bought all my shoes, I would have bought the complete set of the Kramer. Mm -hmm. That's I, I love that knife. Um, I like the fact that it's carbon steel because carbon steel you can you can throw an edge on quick and it. Jeff, I haven't sharpened mine yet. No, you don't I need haven't. to. I mean, all you have to do is throw it on the steel, and it and it brings it right back to. I hit mine two strokes each way on the steel every time I pull it out of the block, and I have not had to sharpen it nope. yet. It and you shouldn't have to sharpen it unless you. The only time that you should have to sharpen it is if you put a little ding in the blade, because yeah, you know I, carbon steel is is a softer steel. I, I'll, I'll also say that that that's my favorite knife at the moment, but I don't always grab that knife out of my block. It depends on what I'm doing as to whether or not I grab that knife because that knife, since it's carbon steel, if I'm cutting with it, it needs to be wiped off and kept dry. And if I know I'm going to be cutting with it and leaving it sitting for any length of time before I wash it and dry it, I grab one of my other knives. Um, so that, that chef knife is getting about 50% of my chef knife work in the kitchen right now. It's not 100%. So... I'm still using the Victorinox, and I'm using the the old uh, Hinkles that I have as well. But Jeff got Jeff got a deal. Oh, that's one. That's oh, yeah. the that's the Kramer. That's the Zwilling Kramer that Jeff yeah. and I both have. Look at I the handle have, on that thing. Yeah, that thing it fits your hand. The really extra nice. depth, the, the depth on the heels, what sold me on that knife. You're, you're not gonna hit your your knuckles. I can get my fat fingers underneath that thing without wrapping my knuckles. I, th there's a six inch chef that I, I would like to add, and Jeff found a place somewhere that has these things on half price during the what is it during the Black Friday season? Black Friday through Christmas. Uh, it's the uh, Georgia North Premium, North Georgia Premium Outlet Malls. They have a Zwilling store there, and everything in the store was fifty percent off. So, so I'm probably going to try. I to walked in there and I said, left. "Is this guy fifty percent off? Because it's four ninety nine. And she goes, "Yes, it is." I go, "I'll take it." <laughs> you got that for less than two fifty, didn't you? I got it for two hundred twelve dollars. Yeah, two twelve. Because retail on that one. I thought it was three fifty. Mm -mm. Retail on it's higher than that because I know I know. Which size did you get? I got the eight. No, I think this is bigger than the eight. I think this is the ten. That looks like the eight. Hang on. Yes, it is the eight. Yeah. But when when that when that one first showed up at Atlanta Grill Company, there was it was selling for three fifty, and uh, when it went on, I bought mine when it went on sale for two ninety nine. But it, it's like it went on sale for two ninety nine and it never went back up. Everybody's got it for two ninety nine now. And uh, and and so you said that uh, if you're going to have yours wet for a little while, you don't use it. Mine does yeah, not. Uh, mine does probably. Not. Mine's probably patinaed well enough now that it's not that much of a problem. So, 
I the only thing kinda... that makes me kind of upset on mine is when I was doing the patina, I got it all the way back into the brass here. Yeah, that's all which right. I would have liked to have not have done, but it's I, it doesn't rust. I have not. Yeah, but then again, I wash it, I dry it. I would like to get the six inch chef, and I would like to get the paring knife. Well, That's I'd like to get the Sant- I'd like to get the Santuca. In it, I'm not I, interested I in those. I'm not interested in those at all. I want the. I like. I love that blade. Yeah, I like the the chef. I like that six inch chef. Uh, that's more of a utility knife for me. How do you get the patina, Janice? You wet down paper towel with vinegar, or you can lay it in a. You can you can make a shallow pool of vinegar in a. Uh, a nine by thirteen baking dish and just lay the knife in it. Mm-hmm. That's what I did, and uh, I did well, that see, I was trying to times. keep. I was trying to keep the brass from getting the patina, so yeah. I, I wrapped the uh, paper towel. So there's multiple ways you can do it, and you do that when you first lemon get juice it. will do it too. And carbon steel, once it gets that patina, it won't rust. It no. just won't rust. And uh, it'll darken, and it'll continue to darken over time. Mm-hmm. It'll get darker and darker as you use it. That that blade will eventually be a really dark gray from that. But this blade here, I love it for chopping. I do my all my vegetables and, and whatnot. The only thing I don't do with it is I don't uh, I don't uh, spatchcock chicken or break down a chicken with it. I use uh, one of my hinkles for that. Well, that one that one would do a chicken, but I I've got the uh the hinkles uh no it's not a hinkles it's a no it is a hinkles it's the zwill it's a Zw- another zwilling knife it's the mm-hmm. hinkles zwilling pro eight inch chef's knife that was the first real chef knife that i ever bought i've had it for a long time but it's a uh it's a german it's a german or a european design it's a thicker german. blade it's a thicker blade and a stronger blade, and that blade will break down. I can break down chicken with that. Yeah, that's that, what I use, that, that I inch for breaking down chicken. I spatchcock with that all the time. I can run that thing right down both sides of the spine on a chicken without any trouble. And see, that's what I don't understand. A lot of people say they have trouble going down you know, the, the spine of a chicken and they get out the shears and whatnot. That that hinkle, man, whoop, whoop, done. Well, it, it's like any other knife. It needs to be sharp for that to be easy. Sure. But uh, I I think it's a lot more work to go down that backbone with a poultry shear. It's uh, oh, it's I do harder. too. <laughs> I do it's too. It's harder and it's slower. I'm, and I'm it wants to twist on. Yeah, man. I just bump, bump and I'm I, done. I have a spine out. I have the the backbone out of a chicken in ten seconds. Yep. With with that knife, if even that. Yeah, Brian, the Zwilling Pro is the one I have. And as far as, let me, let me show you that as far as a good utility chef's knife, that one's hard to beat. It's, uh, mine's got a lot of miles on it, but it's, uh, this is the, uh, is willing you got the same blade. Yours is different from mine. A little different. It's got a different bolster on it right here. Yeah. Mine, mine is the Hinkle. Yeah, this is the uh, Hinkle's Zwilling Pro. But this thing's, uh, I don't know if you can see it in the, yep. it's got a lot of scuffing on it. This thing's beat to death because I've used it a ton. But when I decide, when I learned that I wanted a, a, a better than average quality block style chef's knife. That's the first knife I bought. And I think if I remember correctly, I paid $129 for that, but that's, that's 15 years ago at least. And shortly after that, I bought the uh, matching four inch pairing knife. Yeah. <laughs> what are you sharpening with Jeff? Well, this one here, uh, my son uh, did something on it and put a ding in the blade. So I yeah. took it to Ace to have him sharpen it. Take that Ace ding sharpens out. knobs? Yeah, they've got that uh, 
automatic guy. I forget what the heck it's called. It does a really good job, though. I wonder, if my, I wonder if my Ace hardware has that. It, uh, it, tests, it tests the blade. It it looks at it first, and it determines you know what it needs, and then it, it takes yeah. the edge off of the blade and puts the edge back on the blade. And it, oh, so it's taking a lot of metal off, then. No, no. This, you look here. Yeah. Look at the spine. You don't see any metal taken off. And like I say. Yep. And that's been uh, a month ago it was sharpened, and I use this thing yeah. religiously. And since I've had it done, I have taken the spine out of at least four chickens, and it's still. I don't know how sharp mine is. since I, I don't remember how long it's been since I've sharpened this one, but it, it's not. It's sharp, but it's not. It's not blazingly sharp. <laughs> well, you've you got a dull spot in, in that blade somewhere because you're real sharp, and then it, it goes jagged on you. Well, this is also 24-pound paper. It's not a really lightweight paper. But that uh, that knife hasn't been in the sharpener in probably three months, and it's but, been used. That's not bad considering that knife's been used for a couple months and hasn't but been then, John, the, I can get out super spat, and we can do that too. Yeah. Nobody has a spatula that's as sharp as mine, I can guarantee you. <laughs> I haven't ever sharpened a spatula. I need to look at my spatula game at some point and start figuring that out. I've got a bunch you of You need to have spatulas. one sharp edge on your spatula if you're going to be doing a lot of that griddle cooking. And well, if it decides to stick on that griddle, you'll cut it right off. My spatula will not leave spatulas, anything left. My go-to spatulas on my griddle that I use on my griddle are thin they're very thin they're not thick at all and i'm able to i'm able to slice that thing under a smash burger without any trouble and i've got a heavy spatula that i use for smash burgers that is sharpened on the front edge and one of the side edges but it's it's not sharpened enough to uh to cut paper with is that thin enough for you it's pretty thin this is you won't find spatulas like this anymore with the wooden yeah. handles yeah, industrial quality because they don't want you to have wooden handles. It's unsanitary. I bet you can get wooden handle spatulas. In fact, I know you can. Mercer makes them, and uh, I think uh, Chicago Cutlery, Old Hickory, they still got metal. They got wooden handle spatulas out there. Yeah. <laughs> no. We'll do, oh, I'll do some live stream cooking and I'll have, maybe Jeff, maybe I'll be able to get you to help me when I do that. Because if I use, if I use the live stream platform here, I need somebody to be talking to me and, and interfacing between me and anybody that's watching, because I won't be able to watch the screen so much mm -hmm. if I'm cooking, but uh, we'll play around with that and I'll see it. I, I need to do some testing and uh, I can do testing with live stream or with the stream yard platform here offline and uh, that's one of the cool things here, Jeff, with StreamYard, I can record a session and not broadcast it and broadcast right. it later. That's something uh, that, that this platform will do that I've never done before. So, well, it's past 10 minutes past your. Yeah, I'm going to shut yeah. down because uh, I'm going to go watch the Carolina game with my wife. So y'all have a good week and uh We'll see you next week. And with any luck, I'll have a hot and fast brisket cooked to show you next week. So until oh. then.